An explosion at the Hoover Dam, a huge plume rising above one of the iconic dam's buildings. Officials are blaming it on a transformer explosion, but are not yet sure what sparked it. The fiery scene comes as conditions heat up in the U.S. and other parts of the world. More than 100 million Americans will experience dangerously high temperatures this week. Some cities set to hit triple digits out west as the Northeast braces for a heat wave and record-breaking deadly heat in Western Europe. The United Kingdom reaches 104 degrees, the highest temperature ever recorded there. Ginger Z is standing by with more on this extreme heat and our changing world. Anger and disappointment from families of the children and teachers killed in the Robb Elementary School shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Community members call for the firing of the school's responding officers, as well as the school district's police chief. Now another federal agency is opening an investigation into law enforcement's actions. The January 6th committee prepares to reveal what happened in the 187 minutes from when rioters breached the Capitol until President Trump told them to go home. Two former White House officials are now set to testify at Thursday's primetime hearing as the trial of Steve Bannon begins. An uphill battle. Tired of fighting with insurance companies, people with gender dysphoria are now turning to GoFundMe accounts to pay for the care they feel is necessary. You almost feel trapped in your body stuck with that and I think a lot of people feel like it's so suffocating that they can't live anymore. Revealing the stories behind America's maternal morbidity rates for black women who are more likely to die in childbirth than white and Hispanic women, we talked to part of the team working to tell the stories of families who believe their loved ones could have been saved. My daughter's story is loud, colorful, and artful. It's a day. She was awake, aware, and active. And yet she still died. Our Michael Strahan sits down with the first openly gay active NFL player. Hear his inspiring story and just how afraid he was before he revealed his truth to the world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Unprecedented heat, scorching infernos, widespread famine as the effects of climate change take hold across the world. The UN Secretary General has this stark message. We have a choice, collective action or collective suicide. It is in our hands. Fires burn today in and around London, where for the first time in recorded history, the UK saw a temperature north of 104 degrees. Most homes there are designed to retain heat and do not have air conditioning. Elsewhere in Europe, Spain and Portugal are reporting more than 1,500 heat-related deaths this month alone as fires and rate are raging and across France tonight. And beyond the borders of Europe, the UN warns that people in South Asia, Central and South America and Africa are 15 times more likely to die from extreme weather events. In East Africa, the worst drought in decades means 20 million people could go hungry by September. Three million are at risk of dying. Back here in the U.S. tonight, President Biden is considering declaring a national climate emergency, and 124 million people are under heat advisories. But unlike Europe and much of the world, many Americans have access to air conditioning, as long as the power grid holds. We have team coverage tonight of what's happening across the globe, and we begin with Trevor Ault in Dallas. Tonight, 124 million Americans under heat alerts from the Midwest to the Northeast. <laughs> First responders like MedStar in North Texas fielding urgent calls for help. We were there as they gave aid to this man asleep in his car under the hot sun. Stick up your tongue. His name is Daniel. Pretty hot. Paramedics gave Daniel water, and when he declined to go to the hospital, they encouraged him to find shade. So far this summer, MedStar has responded to twice as many heat-related calls as they did this time last year. Our average age of a patient right now is 45 years old. And most of them think, oh, I'm young, I'm healthy, I can, I can handle it. Not this kind of heat. Forecasters are now sounding the alarm across the region. You're looking at a lot of actual air temperatures around 112, 114. It's not just our daytime highs. Even our overnight lows tonight are going to struggle to really cool down. Multiple cities with overnight lows in the mid 80s. That cumulative heat even more dangerous, already fueling multiple wildfires in Texas, and now it's moving east. Our Mola Lange is in New York City. Well, power crews are already hard at work here in New York City, but the utility company says the real test will be later this week when temperatures rise and the power grid has to endure several consecutive days of extreme heat. 
This after more than four inches of rain in parts of the metro area Monday, a sinkhole in the Bronx swallowing this van. Just so much devastation everywhere from this heat. Trevor Holt joins us now from Dallas. And Trevor, I know you showed us that broken thermometer last night. While that may still be broken, I imagine, at least for now, the power grid doesn't seem to be broken. Still holding up there in Texas. That's right. We're happy to report, Lindsay, that the power grid is continuing to hold its own against what you can imagine is a very intense demand here all across the state. But I mean, we're still looking at extreme triple digit heat coming for the foreseeable future here. And so that means that rolling blackouts are still a very real possibility, Lindsay. Keep that water close. Trevor, our thanks to you. <laughs> And after the hottest night ever recorded in the UK, when the sun rose July 19th, 2022, became the hottest day ever there. Temperatures north of 104 degrees, the extreme heat fueling fires as well. We will Reeve reports in from London. Tonight, striking images of fires burning in and around London on the hottest day ever recorded there. These people battling flames in backyards, desperately trying to save these houses. Firefighters battling at least 10 blazes across the city for much of the day. The temperature rising past 40 degrees Celsius at Heathrow Airport today, 104.4 degrees Fahrenheit. With air conditioning, a rare luxury in Europe, and homes in the UK actually designed to retain heat, there's little relief. Transportation stifled by the heat as well, with delays and suspended service on many underground lines. Across Europe, more than 1,500 heat deaths. Thousands of firefighters battling wildfires that have forced nearly 40,000 from their homes. These people trying to escape the flames, packing whatever they can into the back of their cars. As the UK deals with its hottest day ever, government scientists here are warning that heat events like this could happen every three years. British forecasters predicting more extreme heat more often, a hot new normal, and say the culprit is clearly climate change. If we stop the build of greenhouse gases, all we would do would be stop further warming. We can't really reverse it. So we do have to live with the change we've already put in place. Many talking about this as evidence of global warming. Will Reeve joins us now from London in America. We're so used to air conditioners galore. You've been around in the, the hot streets of London. Just kind of give us a sense of, of the sweltering heat, how it feels. Well, in a word, Lindsay, it felt unprecedented. It was the hottest day ever on record here, and you could certainly feel it. The sun was scorching, no clouds in the sky. People who did brave the heat tried to find shade wherever they could. Folks in the fountain at Trafalgar Square, Serpentine in Hyde Park, anything they could do to cool off because there is no air conditioning in many of the homes, and they were told to stay home from their offices. But the people have made it through, it seems. It rained tonight and temperatures are expected to continue cooling into tomorrow. The rest of Europe, though, some places not so lucky, Lindsay. But little relief, at least ahead for some there. Okay, Will Reeve, our, our thanks to you as always. Our chief meteorologist and managing editor of ABC's climate unit, Ginger Z, joins us now. Ginger, these temperatures aren't, aren't just the usual July heat, and the heat could linger for several more days. Explain to us what's going on here. Yes, so when we talk about all-time July records broken, like Oklahoma City did, well, they tied today, or we look at overnight lows that are going to be warmer than we have ever seen, that's when this takes a turn away from, oh, it's summer, oh, it's a heat advisory, to, no, we're talking about in the 100 to 200 years we've been keeping records, this is breaking that. So that's the type of heat we're talking about with heat advisories from Bakersfield to Boston. But look at the nucleus of the heat. And this is where it's kind of spreading north out of Texas, which has just been tortured this year, uh, into Oklahoma today, into the Ozarks in, in Arkansas, and even western Tennessee and western Mississippi. So tomorrow, you'll see a high... Uh, in the 110 area, but it feels like of 112 for Little Rock. And even look at Nashville, 107. That bubble will keep moving east, but probably more importantly than even just the afternoon highs are those overnight lows, of which Oklahoma City could break and probably will break their maximum overnight low temperature tonight. They'll only drop to 86. Without the privilege of air conditioning, none of us can imagine what that feels like trying to sleep or recover your body from a hot day outside. And then look at this. Back into the 90s we go. The feels likes in New York City will be in the mid-90s. Philadelphia, 101. This will be our second official heat wave in New York City, Boston's first of the season. And it is just going to be scorching really through the end of the week here in the Northeast. 
we talk about overnight lows a lot recently, and that's because we want to really emphasize that's where we see the strongest signals and attribution to climate change. So human-induced climate change has to do with this. This is the climate shift index that shows you how much of the heat can be attributed to climate change by tomorrow morning up to 13 degrees in that deep red area in the southwest all the way through the gulf coast so a lot of it basically and then if you look at june july and august here so over the entire average of the season there average temperature increase in 96 degrees of 246 locations so, so what you're saying is okay I, I understand you're looking at this kind of broad century or century plus but isn't the earth older than that and i always like to remind people that yes we have been hotter than this before but most importantly is that that happened with some other signal earth's orbit changed or solar what we've done here is been able to connect one thing to the rapid rise in temperatures in the last 50 years and that's greenhouse gas emissions from us. Yeah, so you're saying this is all really self-induced there. I think that the, the map really kind of tells the story. And, and we love, of course, Ginge, your, your not-too-late reports for us. So before you go, just lend us a little optimism. I understand that climatologists in the UK and across the globe still believe that we aren't doomed, so to speak, and, and we can still prevent the worst impacts of the climate crisis. So what needs to happen? Not at all doomed. I mean, you know, the use of fossil fuels is finite anyhow, uh, but we still are pumping it as fast as we possibly can. That's not the thing to do. We can't cool what we've already warmed, but we can certainly slow and then stop if we get to net zero. And it's doable. A really, really quick choice or transition, I should say, to renewables is the best way to get there. That's what all of the scientists and, and all of the experts say uh, as far as going forward in the future and having hope because, as I always say, it's not too late. Well, hopefully people will follow that lead. Ginger Z, as always, our thanks to you. Now to the next explosion at one of America's most important hydroelectric plants, the mighty Hoover Dam that provides water and electricity to the southwest. Tonight, authorities say they believe they know what happened. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports. My goodness, someone's just blown out. Tonight, that explosion at Hoover Dam startling visitors at the historic landmark during the peak of tourist season. It's shaking so much. The dam situated on the Colorado River, a key piece of infrastructure in the southwest, providing water and electricity to parts of California, Nevada, and Arizona. And as that fireball went up, tour guides hustling visitors away from the scene. Well, folks, get your video on that. There's just been an incident here. My yeah. goodness, someone's just blown out. Explosion and a fire. We're going to be uh, leaving now, so we don't get trapped in here. The guide uh, said us that uh, there is fire and they are uh, solving this situation. Officials at the dam saying a mechanical problem caused the transformer to catch fire on the Arizona side of the more than 700-foot-tall dam. There were no injuries reported. A fire brigade helping extinguish the flames, as did that internal sprinkler system. Our thanks to Matt Gutman. Tonight, the Secret Service says it cannot find missing text messages from January 5th and 6th, the day leading up to and the day of the insurrection. ABC also learned that during Thursday's primetime hearing, two former White House officials will testify about those 187 minutes from when rioters breached the Capitol and when the former president asked them to go home. Here's our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. The Secret Service responded to a subpoena today from the January 6th committee for its communications immediately before and during the attack on the Capitol. But the committee did not get what it asked for. We did not receive the additional text messages that we were looking for. The Secret Service said it was not able to recover text messages from January 5th and 6th, 2021 that were deleted as part of what it described as a, quote, pre-planned three-month system migration. They said it was up to individual agents to preserve their text messages, and some agents did not do so. This comes as the committee prepares for a primetime hearing Thursday, delving into the 187 minutes that the Capitol was under attack by Trump supporters, and President Trump did nothing to stop them. Let's go, you guys. Two former White House staffers will testify in person. Former Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews and former Deputy National Security Advisor Matthew Pottinger both resigned that day. The committee has already played testimony from both of them describing their reaction when President Trump tweeted during the attack that Vice President Pence, quote, 
didn't have the courage to do what should have been done. We all got a notification, so we knew it was a tweet from the president. It felt like he was pouring gasoline on the fire by tweeting that. I read that tweet uh, and uh, made a decision at that moment to resign. Quite a response there. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. And John, the Secret Service says that those text messages from January 5th and 6th were deleted as part of a pre-planned system migration or a routine process. But everyone was certainly aware that this was a historic moment. Why not just delay that process? I mean, it's, it's really a great question. There is simply no doubt that those messages should have been preserved. In fact, the National Archives has written a letter to the Secret Service demanding to know why they were deleted. But yes, by law, they should have been preserved under any circumstances, but especially surrounding uh, events as significant, historically significant, as what happened on January 6th. Lindsay? Is it possible to retrieve those text messages? The Secret Service says that they're going to do everything possible uh, to retrieve them. They're going to uh, look at every possible technological uh, tool that they have. Uh, so who knows? I mean, as you know, uh, things that are deleted often are not really deleted. So we'll, we'll see. But so far, they have been unable to recover them. See if they're somewhere in the cloud. All right, Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you yeah. as always. We're monitoring the contempt of Congress trial for former White House strategist Steve Bannon. Opening arguments began this afternoon. Bannon is accused of defying a subpoena from the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. For more insight into the trial, we welcome former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York, Mr. Khan Nowaday. Khan, thank you so much as always for joining us. What do you make of the opening statement so far? I thought they were textbook. Uh, from the government side and from the defense side. Uh, typically what happens, the government says to the jury, this is a really simple case, and this is why it's a simple case. And the defense gets up and says, oh, well, wait a second, it's a lot more complicated than that. And that's what Bannon's attorney had done, and he's done as good a job as he can do by saying, hey, wait a second, there are these discussions, and Mr. Bannon, he, he didn't willfully disregard this subpoena. So what is the centerpiece, essentially, then, for Bannon's defense? The centerpiece is, as with many of these uh, public uh, white-collar crimes, um, is criminal intent. And his defense is, I had no criminal intent. I didn't willfully disregard this subpoena. And I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to point to the discussions that happened between his attorney and the government attorney to show that, well, wait a second, he wasn't really expected to show up uh, on that date in October. What kind of problems could potentially arise based on that defense? I think it's uh, very problematic for Bannon. Um, it's very dangerous. He's opening a, a Pandora's box. If it's true that his lawyer will come and testify on his behalf, he potentially is waiving attorney-client privilege with respect to his conversations with his attorney. And frankly, nobody ever wants your lawyer to be testifying for you in a criminal case. So the Justice Department has the burden of proving four distinct elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Kind of break down what those four elements are. And first off, Lindsay, that is correct. In criminal trials, the prosecution has to prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It's the standard we've been using in this country than since the country was founded. Uh, it's a higher standard than in civil cases. In civil cases, all you have to prove if you're the plaintiff is that more likely than not, the person did what you accused them of doing. All uh, beyond reasonable doubt is, all reasonable doubt is, is simply a, a doubt that is based on reason and common sense. It cannot be a doubt about the defendant's guilt that is based on speculation. And it's also important to remember that the government does not have to prove the defendant's guilt beyond all possible doubt. If there's a doubt that is reasonable, that is based on common sense, that's the only type of doubt the jury is able to consider. And you mentioned that Bannon's attorney might take the witness stand. Who else do you think might? I expect, as we've already seen, the uh, DOJ attorney who testified earlier today, who dealt with the discussions with Bannon's attorney, would testify that, and has testified, that there was this subpoena, and that I believe she's going to testify, she hasn't already, that he didn't show up. Uh, I expect that there could be a witness from the congressional investigation to prove up the element that this testimony and these documents they were seeking from Bannon were relevant to their investigation. And, and lastly, when 
we saw Steve Bannon right before, on the eve, basically, of this uh, trial say, uh, you know what, actually, I'll talk. I'll go before the committee and I'll talk. Do Is the thinking here that he thought that that would supersede then the trial, that that would make this go away? I think so. I think he thought maybe now he can try to go make amends. That's number one. But really, I think what he was trying to do was basically delay things and try to push off the trial date. Con Nowaday, our thanks to you as always. ABC News will have live on-air coverage of the January 6th committee hearing. It begins at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on Thursday, right after Prime. Anger, frustration, and a demand for accountability all at a boiling point for the families of the victims of the Uvalde school shooting. At a school board meeting, they raised doubts about school safety. The next semester is set to start in just a few weeks. Those families also learned that autopsy results for the victims could take as long as a year to be completed. Our Maria Villarreal has the latest. Hundreds packing Uvalde's high school auditorium, holding signs saying, we want accountability. Maybe one of you guys will come and say, we failed you, Uvalde. Confusion and frustration now turning into absolute fury. After a newly released investigative report and body camera footage reveals Rob Elementary did not adequately prepare for the risk of an armed intruder on campus. We had people telling y'all that the doors didn't lock and y'all didn't do a damn thing about it. Why? That the expectation is those doors to be locked. The 77-page investigative report asserting Rob Elementary had a culture of non-compliance with safety policies about door locks, which turned out to be fatal. Jasmine Gossetis lost her little sister Jackie in the shooting. What are you going to do to make sure I don't have to wait 77 minutes bleeding out on my classroom floor just like my little sister did? The superintendent promising last night they would focus on safety, saying they plan to install higher fences around schools and new cameras inside, replacing doors and locks, beefing up Wi-Fi capabilities, and they're delaying the start of school to get it all done. Some calling for the district to implement a Marshall program allowing staff to carry guns on campus. It is evident that no one is coming for us, and we must protect our own. Others demanding every officer on the school district police force be fired. They need to be accountable and they need to leave and they need to turn in their badges and they need to go now. The committee also finding law enforcement officers failed to prioritize saving the lives of innocent victims over their own safety. Victims like friends of Maylee Taylor, who was at Robb Elementary the day of the shooting. This was the last dress that my, all my friends saw me on. Most of those kids were my friends, and that's not good. And I don't want to go to your guys' school if they don't have protection. So heartbreaking to hear that sentiment from children. Maria Villarreal joins us now from San Antonio. Maria, is there a timeline for the school district to get all of these security adjustments completed? Well, you know, Lindsay, initially they wanted to try and have this all ready and done for school, which was set to be around August 18th. But as of last night, the district did tell parents they want to push that back even further to about the first week of September, just after Labor Day. But even then, the people in the audience last night were very frustrated and angry, and they are in disbelief. They do not think, they do not trust this school board, and they don't believe that these safety measures are going to be in place by that time. So right now, a lot of parents, as you heard, are still refusing to send their kids back to school they want action and really they want someone to stand up on those stages and say we failed you we made major mistakes here is what we have done so far to fix it right some kind of acknowledgement and adjustment maria Villarreal, our thanks to you you can of course count on abc news to continue bringing you the latest in the uvalde school shooting investigation when we come back, the unusual arrest, the officer galloping through the streets of New York, plus the tragedy involving a crew member of law and order gunned down. And insurance companies refusing to pay for critical care. That's not new, but for those with gender dysphoria, it can be crushing. We follow two people as they try to pay for their life-changing gender reassignment surgeries, and you'll see just how challenging it can be. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3. What you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take a look at this unusual arrest in New York after an officer on a horseback got a call about a robbery. The body camera footage shows the officer confronting the suspect who fled, leading to this chase or gallop through the streets of Manhattan. The suspect was later apprehended by an officer who was on foot. For those who have health insurance, getting a call from your doctor or the insurance company saying a procedure isn't covered is certainly not unheard of. But for those suffering from gender dysphoria, the obstacles can prove even more challenging. But in a mission to get help, many have turned to loved ones, side hustles, even GoFundMe. Arcana Whitworth has this report on the uphill battle to fund gender reaffirming care. I can only remember how much I wanted to be a boy growing up and how deep down I had to bury those feelings because I never felt like anybody would understand. We're essentially going to dissect out all of the breast tissue. Now, when we say all of the breast tissue, what we mean is probably like 98, 99%. All right, all right take great care, so everybody. Yes, sir. See you on the other side. All right. It's the day Chase Riley has been waiting for. After eight years of hormone replacement and psychological therapy, Chase is getting his breasts removed. I suppressed these feelings of wanting to be a boy for so long. Sometimes people are having such a hard time living in their skin that it takes a toll on their mental health. And that's why you believe these surgeries are life-saving. Yes. It's not cosmetic. Yes. According to a study from the Williams Institute in 2019, it's estimated that nearly 82% of transgender individuals have considered suicide and 40% have attempted it. You almost feel trapped in your body and stuck with that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people feel like that's so suffocating that they can't live anymore. I never felt personally like I was supposed to be born a man. 
I just felt like I was always supposed to become one. Sometimes I see myself and sometimes I see her. I don't really feel like I'm always in control of who I see. And I think this will just be a really big step. Many seeking these gender affirming surgeries experience a medical condition called gender dysphoria, a mental stress and discomfort those who identify as a different gender than the one assigned at birth sometimes face. These surgeries can serve as a form of treatment in gender dysphoria. I was with Courtney, my partner, and she encouraged me to explore my desire for top surgery. Like many in the trans community, Chase turned to GoFundMe as his breast removal or top surgery was not covered by insurance. It's very hard for me to ask for help, but that's the best way that a lot of people can think to fund their surgeries. Gender affirming surgeries can range anywhere from $2,000 for individual procedures to over $100,000 for more extensive transitions. I wrote insurance off very early on in my experience. Individual employers indicate that a small number of employees actually take advantage of related health insurance benefits. Additionally, most insurers and people consider trans-related health care as cosmetic, even though the American Medical Association has classified gender-affirming surgeries as medically necessary. Chase says, for him, it's a matter of life and death. I paid most out of pocket. Actually, all of my journey has been out of pocket as of now. Fortunately, my partner is fronting me the money. Lavender. Lavender, come here. My name is Mia. I'm 30 years old, and I identify as a trans woman of color. We're normal people, too. We go through life, and we have fun, and we have a story to tell. I was put in the hospital for a few weeks because I tried to commit suicide as a 13, 14 year old, because I was being bullied, harassed, and consistently attacked, not just outside of my home, but in my home as well. I am pretty far within my transition. I still have a few more things I need to get done. Mia was able to have her top surgery covered by Medicaid, but is finding different ways to cover the additional out-of-pocket costs. I've raised at least $30,000 besides my GoFundMe. And that's over a time span of four years. And due to the difficult barriers of getting facial feminization surgery, or FFS, approved by Medicaid in Illinois, Mia forced to travel out of the state to get the procedure. The cost have been scary. When it comes to FFS, it's your face. So you want something done right and done well by one of the best doctors you can. Insurance don't cover that. So I had to raise $20,000 just for the face itself. It's not easy finding work here in Illinois being trans. Leading Mia to start her own business. I make lip glosses, lip balms, and embroidery, sweaters, totes, shirts. I understand that surgery is a high cost, but like other things that are deemed medically necessary, they should be covered mostly by your insurance company. And while 24 states and Washington, D.C. prohibit transgender exclusions in health insurance, 10 states have Medicaid policies that specifically exclude trans health coverage. The spokesperson for the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services stated, CMS is aware that certain states have announced that they may issue legislation or rulemaking related to gender-affirming care. CMS will review any such state action. Without insurance companies agreeing with the top medical organization's findings that these surgeries can be medically necessary, most in the trans community are lost. For trans people, it's safety, it's security. It's also being happy with what you see in the mirror. This is our one life, our one body. It's not that they're this trying to become that. They've always been this, what are essentially born with what they see as a birth defect. And all they want to do is fix it and be themselves. I knew I was a girl and I reminded myself that I still wanted to be a boy. So I never really wanted to be trans. I just wanted to be a boy. 
Our thanks to Kena for that. Still ahead, lawmakers put in handcuffs and taken away. Why Capitol Police arrested 17 members of Congress. More fallout over allegations of racial bias at Sesame Place Park. The changes that are now being implemented. Is your car a prime target for thieves? The most stolen cars by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Justin Bieber announces he will resume his tour on July 31st. He paused it last month after experiencing facial paralysis caused by Ramsey Hunt syndrome. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series streaming free on ABC News Live. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. Some car owners may want to be a little more vigilant than others. The National Insurance Crime Bureau just released its 2021 report on stolen cars. We're counting down the most desirable models for thieves by the numbers. 17,270 Toyota Camrys were stolen, landing it in fifth place. The most popular model year targeted 2007. Thieves made away with 30,274 Honda Accords, mostly taking models made all the way back in 1997, putting it in fourth place. Honda also took the third spot with 31,673 Civics stolen. The model made in the year 2000 had the most reported thefts, but it seems that criminals prefer trucks. 47,999 full-size Ford pickups were taken. Again, an older model was still the most popular, 2006. 48,206 full-size Chevrolet pickups were taken last year. Thieves favored the 2004 model. The report said there has been a nearly 35% increase in used car values over the past two years due to supply chain issues and inflation, which could explain the preference for older models. Nearly 1 million total vehicles were reported stolen in 2021, according to the research. Stolen cars can be shipped overseas and resold or broken down for valuable used car parts here in the U.S. The report recommends that Owners follow basic steps to keep their car safe, locking doors, rolling up windows, and always taking your keys or key fob with you when you get out of the vehicle. It also suggests adding a tracking device to your car.
And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The new push to stop fake reviews on Amazon. We have the details. And our Michael Strahan sits down with the first openly gay NFL player. Hear his inspiring story. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. at stake in our world right now we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making abc news america's number one news and thank you for making abc news live america's number one streaming news now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Scorching heat across the globe and across the country. Fires raging in North Texas as the state deals with record temperatures. Experts say climate change is to blame as temperatures rise faster than scientists anticipated. Much of Texas has seen no measurable rain for weeks. People being asked to limit use of electricity and water. Now a heat wave is moving into the Northeast. 60 million in the U.S. are expected to face temperatures of 100 degrees or higher in the coming days. Overseas, French officials warning of a heat apocalypse as temperatures soar to 109 degrees. More than 1,100 heat-related deaths accounted for in Spain and Portugal. Officials warning that number will climb. Offices, stores, schools, and some museums shutting down in London as the city records its hottest day on record. A number of lawmakers were arrested at a Washington, D.C. protest in response to the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. U.S. Capitol Police say 17 members of Congress were among those taken into custody after police said they blocked the street and ignored warnings. Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney confirmed in a statement she was among those arrested, saying there is no democracy if women do not have control over their own bodies and decisions about their own health, including reproductive care. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, who was also arrested, tweeted she would continue to do everything in her power to raise the alarm about the assault on reproductive rights. Capitol Police arrested 35 demonstrators total. 
Police are investigating a stabbing at San Francisco's airport. Police say a man was stabbed at around 4.55 in the morning. The injuries are not life-threatening. Police say another man was detained and the area was secured. San Francisco's airport has had a number of issues in recent months. Earlier this year, there was a police shooting of a man at the airport. And days ago, a bomb threat caused a large-scale evacuation, now a stabbing in the baggage claim area. A crew member on TV's Law & Order was killed this morning in New York City. Police say a gunman fatally shot the 31-year-old man while sitting in his car to reserve parking spots for a film shoot in Brooklyn. The victim was identified as Johnny Pizarro. Police say the suspect, wearing a black hoodie and black pants, shot Pizarro multiple times before fleeing the scene. No arrests have been made. The show's production team issuing a statement saying we were terribly saddened and shocked to hear that one of our crew members was the victim of a crime early this morning and has died as a result. We are working with local law enforcement as they continue to investigate. Amazon has sued more than 10,000 Facebook group administrators for allegedly trying to orchestrate fake reviews on the site in exchange for money or free products. The company said the groups were recruiting and incentivizing people to post reviews on Amazon's stores in the U.S. and six other countries. The tech giant said one of the groups, Amazon Product Review, had more than 43,000 members and purposely evaded Facebook's regulators until it was taken down earlier this year. Amazon said it has reported more than 10,000 fake review groups to Meta since 2020, and Meta has taken down more than half of the groups. Sesame Workshop says it will conduct bias training and review how it engages with families and guests after a viral video taken at its Sesame Place Park in Philadelphia raised concerns of potential racial bias. It shows two black girls were waiting to greet the character Rosita. The mascot high-fived other attendees but skipped over the girls and appeared to wave them off. The incident has caused outrage with calls to boycott the park growing on social media. The maternal morbidity rate in the United States right now that is disproportionately affecting black women. The U.S. maternal morbidity rate is the highest out of all industrialized nations. The CDC, in fact, estimates this year that black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white and Hispanic women. In the documentary Aftershock, producer and directors Tanya Lewis-Lee and Paula Eiselt follow the aftermath from the untimely deaths of two young black women, Shimani Gibson and Amber Rose Isaac, who die due to what their family say was medical negligence. Let's take a look. My daughter's story is loud, colorful, and artful. It's a game! She was awake, aware, and active. And yet she still died. Tanya and Paula, we thank you so much for joining us in studio. Exciting that Aftershock is now out on Hulu today. Uh, so let's just start right off the top because, you know, a lot of times people are looking at this and we're going to get into the fact that this is uh, especially impacting black women. But also in the film, you talk about how this is unusually high in the United States. When we're talking about other countries, they don't see the death rates that we see here. What's the explanation for that? Well, it's really interesting because um, in other industrialized nations, midwifery care is integrated into women's care. The United States is the only developed nation that does not have midwifery uh, care integrated into women's health, and their outcomes are better than ours. So if you want to compare us to other nations, I, I would start there. And Paula, we see throughout the movie where the family's um, grief is really turned into activism, right? It, what can we do to save more lives like Shimani's and, and Amber's? Yeah, th this is a very solvable crisis. This is something we can fix. Um, as Tanya said, we need more midwives in the system, um, especially more midwives of color. Uh, we also need doula care, which is, you know, a doula is an advocate that can come with a woman to the hospital um, or any birth setting and advocate, help that woman advocate for herself. And I think that many people had heard the statistics ahead of time, right? But in the movie, you really kind of explain the backstory of why, especially why we see black women who are three times more likely to die from, from childbirth. So kind of give us, touch on those points a, a bit for us now. Yeah, I mean, what we came away from with the film is that often when black women show up looking for help because they are looking for help when they're not feeling well and they say, I don't feel well, 
they're, they're dismissed. So black women are not seen, they're not heard when they go looking for their own help. They are as healthy as they can be often. Uh, and for some reason, our society just doesn't want to listen to us. And also you brought up the idea that the black women disproportionately are often using Medicare or Medicaid. And what does that mean as far as when you go to have a, a baby? So a lot of hospital systems, they have two separate kinds of care. There's the private patients that have private insurance and there's the clinic patients. Um, and, if, and if you're a clinic patient, you have Medicaid or, or Medicare, you don't have a consistent doctor necessarily. You have who's there, you don't have a doctor on call for you. Whereas if you have a private physician, you have a relationship, you have a rapport, um, you can build trust. It's very hard when you're seen, when you don't have that consistency. And the, the, it often, you were talking about the difference in the C-section versus the vaginal birth, right? That the C-section can make more money for the hospital, it's faster, right? And then also you have a lot of the, the Medicare and Medicaid patients, I suppose, who are uh, getting the, the teaching, the, the doctors who are just learning. Yeah, unfortunately, the most vulnerable people are treated by those that have the least experience because they're really trying to learn. But I also want to say, though, that black women, this issue of uh, black maternal health goes across socioeconomic lines as black women we are all really at risk and and to that point you know it's been said that uh, from the beginning reproductive health was really racist I mean how so the maternal mortality crisis didn't just pop up out of nowhere this is part of a historical continuum from 1619 um, that has devalued and dehumanized black women and that started uh, during slavery times when black women were experimented on um, James Marion Sims who's known as the father of gynecology did horrific experiments on enslaved black women and then that goes to the 20th century where um, black midwives were essentially eradicated and white men came and really took over the profession um, of birthing. We don't have an integrated maternal health system. It, something else that you really focus on is the bond that develops between Bruce and Amari, who obviously both lost their, their partners and the mothers of their children. And I just want to take a clip from, uh, look at a clip from the Weeksville Heritage Center, where the idea of the support and activism group for black men was formed. Let's take a look. I never thought that this would happen to my family. Yes. Because I do reproductive mm -hmm. justice right. work. Mm -hmm. But you know, just also, why wouldn't it? We're black and brown. Right. You know, she's a woman, she was having a baby, mm -hmm. so why would we think we would be exempt because we have the knowledge? Mm -hmm. Knowledge doesn't save you That's from right. this epidemic. Right. Some powerful words from Shamani's mom there. What do people need beyond education um, to really make a change here? People need to advocate for themselves and be empowered, but I really think it's incumbent on the system to listen and see women, especially black women, and, and center them in care. You can choose to birth the midwife, you can choose a birthing center if you can access one. Um, there are other ways that you can birth and um, you have a right to evidence-based care. Paula, Tanya, congratulations on this baby that you have birthed <laughs> that we can all take a look at now on Hulu. The powerful documentary, Aftershock, is available right now. Now to the ABC News exclusive with the first active player in the NFL to come out as gay. The NFL defensive end says that he initially agonized over his decision to publicly come out as gay last offseason after his sixth year in the league. But then one post on Instagram changed it all. Here's Michael Strahan with more. Carl Nassib. 29-year-old Carl Nassib had been playing in the NFL for six years. The star defensive end, known for great plays on the field. Reception by Nassib. But after last season ended in June, Nassib posted his highly personal video to his Instagram. I'm at my house here in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Just want to take a quick moment to say that I'm gay. I've been meaning to do this for a while now, but I finally feel comfortable enough to get it off my chest. Nassib becoming the first active player in the NFL to come out. I'm a pretty private person, so I hope you guys know that I'm really not doing this for attention. Um, I just think that representation and visibility are so important. So take me back to that moment. You filmed the video. You're about to hit send. And I like stared at the phone for like an hour, just looking at it and like trying to hype myself up. And the last thing I said was like, you know what, for the kids. And I like pressed post. He said it was something he agonized over. 15 years. That's how long you said you thought about this. Oh, for sure. It definitely was some difficult times and really struggling with who you are and trying to figure out that side of your life was definitely a tough part. But what made you decide or feel that that was the right moment to do it? 
I came out to my close friends and family like years ago, and I uh, wanted to do it publicly because I wanted to stay ahead of the narrative. I just wanted to own the story and make sure I did it on my terms. One of my biggest fears was that I would only be remembered for being gay. I just wanted to show that it really doesn't matter your sexual orientation. His announcement was met with a tidal wave of support on social media too, from celebrities to fellow NFL players. But what about his own team? Now you have to go into a locker room full of men in the most macho sport in this country. Did that scare you at all? I really wasn't scared about that at all. I had a great relationship with my teammates and I just was met with the most incredible support from my teammates. And what was the reaction from the NFL? They are so supportive. Uh, I'm just incredibly thankful for all the support they've given and they're continuing to do. It's a level of support that NASA would like everyone to be met with. I actually hope that like one day videos like this and the whole coming out process are just not necessary. Um, but until then, you know, I'm gonna do my best and do my part to cultivate a culture that's accepting, that's compassionate. So as a society, how do we get to that point? When people come out, they're coming out of the closet. And they're coming out of the closet because they're afraid. They have fear that they're going to have negative impact on their life, on their relationships, on their job. I just hope that one day we don't have those fears. That's the society I hope for one day. And I hope I can be a positive push in that direction. Statistics show that support for the LGBTQ community can be life-saving. A recent survey found that 45% of LGBTQ youth had contemplated suicide in the last year. But those who had support from family attempted suicide less than half the rate. What do you say for those kids at home who see bills being passed, having faith that things are getting better and not going backwards? They have support from a massive community of people who love them no matter what and we are making strides in a positive direction. It, it won't be a perfect road, and we just have to continue the course and make sure that we do it um, from a place of love and not from a place of animosity. The six foot seven pro went on to donate $100,000 to the Trevor Project, a nonprofit that supports the LGBTQ community. The NFL matching that donation. You've gotten so many anonymous messages, at least the Trevor Project has from the LGBTQ plus community. Do you mind if I read you a few? Absolutely. Thank you for your courage and your honesty. You may very well have saved some lives today. Another one. Way to be a leader on and off the field, Carl. You are saving lives through your bravery. And last but not least, seeing your message today made me so excited to be part of a world where I could see people like me in any sort of public role. Love it. That's incredible. I hope that I can continue to be that person. With the football season approaching, Carl is getting ready for football camp as a free agent. Were you surprised that the Raiders released you? I was not. I think that it was a great time. I have so much love for Las Vegas. It allowed me to do a lot of great things. And I think that there will be more, there will be better opportunities in the future. But you hope to keep playing on, of course. Definitely, yeah. You still got a lot left. Got a lot in the tank. Got a, got a lot, lot in the tank, in man. Days. Our thanks to Michael Strahan. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at this eagle in the UK, like so many around the world, just trying to cool off. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. In the next hour, record-shattering heat across the U.S. and Western Europe. What could be causing these deadly heat waves? An explosion at a historic landmark. What led to this fiery scene? America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download Load it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust 
and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Police say the bystander who stopped a mass shooter in an Indiana mall shot and killed him just 15 seconds after the attack started. The gunman killed three people on Sunday before Elijah Dickin confronted him. Two others were hurt. The suspect had more than 100 rounds of ammunition on him, but only fired 24 rounds before being shot. Another blow for Netflix. The company lost 970000 thousand subscribers in the second quarter. It is fewer than the two million it predicted, which caused shares to go up. This comes days after Netflix announced that it's working on a cheaper ad supported version of its service and cracking down on password sharing. The cost to fill up your gas tank is thankfully going down. AAA says the national average price for a gallon of gas fell below $4.50 for the first time since the middle of May. The current price of $4.49 is 10% lower than its peak of $5.01 last month. The price crossed the milestone amid a sustained fall in gas prices over the past month, caused in part to a decline in global demand. Tonight, the Secret Service says it cannot find missing text messages from January 5th and 6th, the day leading up to and the day of the insurrection. ABC also learned that during Thursday's primetime hearing, two former White House officials will testify about those 187 minutes from when rioters breached the Capitol and when the former president asked them to go home. Here's our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. The Secret Service responded to a subpoena today from the January 6th committee for its communications immediately before and during the attack on the Capitol. But the committee did not get what it asked for. We did not receive the additional text messages that we were looking for. The Secret Service said it was not able to recover text messages from January 5th and 6th, 2021 that were deleted as part of what it described as a, quote, pre-planned three-month system migration. They said it was up to individual agents to preserve their text messages, and some agents did not do so. This comes as the committee prepares for a primetime hearing Thursday, delving into the 187 minutes that the Capitol was under attack by Trump supporters, and President Trump did nothing to stop them. Let's go, you guys. Two former White House staffers will testify in person. Former Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews and former Deputy National Security Advisor Matthew Pottinger both resigned that day. The committee has already played testimony from both of them describing their reaction when President Trump tweeted during the attack that Vice President Pence, quote, didn't have the courage to do what should have been done. We all got a notification, so we knew it was a tweet from the president. It felt like he was pouring gasoline on the fire by tweeting that. I read that tweet. Uh, and uh, made a decision at that moment to resign. Tonight, overseas unprecedented heat is taking its toll. More than 1,500 people have died in Spain and Portugal. And today, the U.K. saw its hottest day ever recorded. Here in the U.S., President Biden is now considering declaring a national climate emergency. And more than 100 million people are under heat advisories. But unlike Europe and much of the world, many Americans do have access to air conditioning as long as the power grid holds. We have team coverage tonight of what's happening across the globe weather-wise, and we begin with Trevor Alton, Dallas. Tonight, 124 million Americans under heat alerts from the Midwest to the Northeast. 
First responders like MedStar in North Texas fielding urgent calls for help. We were there as they gave aid to this man asleep in his car under the hot sun. Stick up your tongue for me. His name is Daniel. It's pretty hot. Yeah, it's hot. Paramedics gave Daniel water, and when he declined to go to the hospital, they encouraged him to find shade. So far this summer, MedStar has responded to twice as many heat-related calls as they did this time last year. Our average age of a patient right now is 45 years old, and most of them think, oh, I'm young, I'm healthy, I can, I can handle it. Not this kind of heat. Forecasters are now sounding the alarm across the region. You're looking at a lot of actual air temperatures around 112, 114. It's not just our daytime highs. Even our overnight lows tonight are going to struggle to really cool down. Multiple cities with overnight lows in the mid 80s. That cumulative heat even more dangerous, already fueling multiple wildfires in Texas, and now it's moving east. Our Mola Lange is in New York City. Well, power crews are already hard at work here in New York City, but the utility company says the real test will be later this week when temperatures rise and the power grid has to endure several consecutive days of extreme heat. This after more than four inches of rain in parts of the metro area Monday, a sinkhole in the Bronx swallowing this van. So much devastation being attributed to the heat. Our thanks to Trevor for that. And after the hottest night ever recorded in the UK, once the sun came up, July 19th, 2022 became the hottest day ever seen there. Temperatures north of 104 degrees. The extreme heat fueling fires there. Will Reeve reports in tonight from London. Tonight, striking images of fires burning in and around London on the hottest day ever recorded there. These people battling flames in backyards, desperately trying to save these houses. Firefighters battling at least 10 blazes across the city for much of the day. The temperature rising past 40 degrees Celsius at Heathrow Airport today, 104.4 degrees Fahrenheit. With air conditioning, a rare luxury in Europe, and homes in the UK actually designed to retain heat, there's little relief. Transportation stifled by the heat as well, with delays and suspended service on many underground lines. Across Europe, more than 1,500 heat deaths. Thousands of firefighters battling wildfires that have forced nearly 40,000 from their homes. These people trying to escape the flames, packing whatever they can into the back of their cars. As the UK deals with its hottest day ever, government scientists here are warning that heat events like this could happen every three years. British forecasters predicting more extreme heat more often, a hot new normal, and say the culprit is clearly climate change. If we stop the build of greenhouse gases, all we would do would be stop further warming. We can't really reverse it. So we do have to live with the change we've already put in place. Unprecedented heat there. Our thanks to Will Reeve. Our chief meteorologist and managing editor of ABC's climate unit, Ginger Z, joins us now. Ginger, these temperatures aren't, aren't just the usual July heat, and the heat could linger for several more days. Explain to us what's going on here. Yes, so when we talk about all-time July records broken, like Oklahoma City did, well, they tied today, or we look at overnight lows that are going to be warmer than we have ever seen, that's when this takes a turn away from, oh, it's summer, oh, it's a heat advisory, to, no, we're talking about in the 100 to 200 years we've been keeping records, this is breaking that. So that's the type of heat we're talking about with heat advisories from Bakersfield to Boston. But look at the nucleus of the heat. And this is where it's kind of spreading north out of Texas, which has just been tortured this year, uh, into Oklahoma today, into the Ozarks in, in Arkansas, and even western Tennessee and western Mississippi. So tomorrow, you'll see a high uh, in the 110 area, but it feels like of 112 for Little Rock. And even look at Nashville, 107. That bubble will keep moving east, but probably more importantly than even just the afternoon highs are those overnight lows, of which Oklahoma City could break and probably will break their maximum overnight low temperature tonight. They'll only drop to 86. Without the privilege of air conditioning, none of us can imagine what that feels like trying to sleep or recover your body from a hot day outside. And then look at this. Back into the 90s we go. The feels likes in New York City will be in the mid-90s. Philadelphia 101. This will be our second official heat wave in New York City, Boston's first of the season. And it is just going to be scorching really through the end of the week here in the Northeast. We talk about overnight lows a lot recently, and that's because we want to really emphasize that's where we see the strongest signals and attribution to climate change. So human-induced climate change has to do with this. This is the climate shift index that shows you how much of the heat 
can be attributed to climate change. By tomorrow morning, up to 13 degrees in that deep red area in the southwest, all the way through the Gulf Coast. So a lot of it, basically. And then if you look at June, July, and August here, so over the entire average of the season there, average temperature increase in 96 degrees of 246 locations. So, so what you're saying is, okay, I, I understand you're looking at this kind of broad century or century plus, but isn't the earth older than that? And I always like to remind people that yes, we have been hotter than this before, but most importantly, is that that happened with some other signal, Earth's orbit changed or solar. What we've done here is been able to connect one thing to the rapid rise in temperatures in the last 50 years, and that's greenhouse gas emissions from us. Yeah, so you're saying this is all really self-induced there. I think that the, the map really kind of tells the story. And, and we love, of course, Ginge, your, your not-too-late reports for us. So before you go, just lend us a little optimism. I understand that climatologists in the UK and across the globe still believe that we aren't doomed, so to speak, and, and we can still prevent the worst impacts of the climate crisis. So what needs to happen? Not at all doomed. I mean, you know, the use of fossil fuels is finite anyhow, uh, but we still are pumping it as fast as we possibly can. That's not the thing to do. We can't cool what we've already warmed, but we can certainly slow and then stop if we get to net zero. And it's doable. A really, really quick choice or transition, I should say, to renewables is the best way to get there. That's what all of the scientists and, and all of the experts say uh, as far as going forward in the future and having hope because, as I always say, it's not too late. Well, hopefully people will follow that lead. Ginger Z, as always, our thanks to you. Anger, frustration, and a demand for accountability, all at a boiling point for the families of the victims of the Uvalde school shooting. At a school board meeting, they raised doubts about school safety. The next semester is set to start in just a few weeks. Those families also learned that autopsy results for the victims could take as long as a year to be completed. Our Maria Villarreal has the latest. Hundreds packing Uvalde's high school auditorium, holding signs saying, we want accountability. Maybe one of you guys will come and say, we failed you, Uvalde. Confusion and frustration now turning into absolute fury. After a newly released investigative report and body camera footage reveals Rob Elementary did not adequately prepare for the risk of an armed intruder on campus. We had people telling y'all that the doors didn't lock and y'all didn't do a damn thing about it. Why? That the expectation is those doors to be locked. The 77-page investigative report asserting Rob Elementary had a culture of non-compliance with safety policies about door locks, which turned out to be fatal. Jasmine Gossetis lost her little sister Jackie in the shooting. What are you going to do to make sure I don't have to wait 77 minutes bleeding out on my classroom floor just like my little sister did? The superintendent promising last night they would focus on safety, saying they plan to install higher fences around schools and new cameras inside, replacing doors and locks, beefing up Wi-Fi capabilities, and they're delaying the start of school to get it all done. Some calling for the district to implement a Marshall program allowing staff to carry guns on campus. It is evident that no one is coming for us, and we must protect our own. Others demanding every officer on the school district police force be fired. They need to be accountable and they need to leave and they need to turn in their badges and they need to go now. The committee also finding law enforcement officers failed to prioritize saving the lives of innocent victims over their own safety. Victims like friends of Maylee Taylor, who was at Robb Elementary the day of the shooting. This was the last dress that my, all my friends saw me on. Most of those kids were my friends, and that's not good. And I don't want to go to your guys' school if they don't have protection. So difficult to hear those sentiments from children. Our thanks to Maria for that. Now to the war in Ukraine. Today, Russia's Vladimir Putin visited Iran, deepening their ties. And according to U.S. intelligence, Putin is preparing to buy drones. This comes as a report is released that accuses Russia of operating several detention camps outside of Mariupol, holding thousands of Ukrainians captive in horrific conditions. Here's ABC's senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel. 
President Biden made an unannounced appearance on the White House South Lawn this afternoon to join his wife in welcoming Elena Zelenska, the first lady of Ukraine. Zelenska is set to deliver remarks before U.S. lawmakers on Capitol Hill tomorrow. A White House spokesman today saying declassified intelligence shows Russia's preparing to annex what it already controls in Ukraine and more. We're seeing ample evidence in the intelligence and in the public domain that Russia intends to try to annex additional Ukrainian territory. It all comes as Vladimir Putin was in Iran, only his second overseas trip since the war began, meeting Iran's president and the Ayatollah who called NATO a, quote, dangerous entity. The U.S. is warning that Tehran could provide armed drones to help Russia's war, replenishing its depleting arsenal, something Iran denies. David, the Ukrainian military tonight claiming it stabilised the front lines in the east and southeast for now, saying an important factor has been those U.S. HIMAR rocket systems, but as we know, they want more. David? We'll take that back here. Our thanks to Ian. Still to come, you may remember this video, a man emerging from the flames of a wildfire in Spain. What we're now learning about his injuries. You can buy it in a six-pack at the store, but in the past, beer was used to treat wounds. One author talks us through the medicinal history of alcohol. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen She's in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. We've known for decades that our climate is changing and the planet's temperature is rising. This is partly because of the greenhouse effect and a consequence of our emissions. And the largest contributors in the U.S. are emissions from things we rely on every day. But greenhouse gases also keep our planet inhabitable. So how does the greenhouse effect both help and harm our planet? And how did it get so off balance? The temperature on Earth is regulated because of our atmosphere the jacket of gases that surrounds the planet like a greenhouse. It allows some of the sun's energy to pass through to the Earth's surface, where it's absorbed and heats the planet. When that energy radiates back up into the atmosphere, 90% is absorbed by gases and continues warming the Earth. This is the greenhouse effect, and it's what allows life to thrive here. But the increase in greenhouse gas emissions from human activity has led to extra trapped heat, and higher global temperatures, and what we now call global warming. So the same effect that keeps our planet alive is also what's damaging it. If we look back, for most of the last 800,000 years, the concentration of greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere was about 200 to 280 parts per million. But over the last century, we've been emitting more and more. 
In 2019, humans were pumping out 36.7 billion tons of CO2. That's about 50% more than in the year 2000. And air temperatures have gone up about two degrees in the last century, which might not seem like much, but a few degrees makes a huge difference in our climate. So how exactly do humans contribute to this? We all leave a carbon footprint by participating in systems that release carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That means things like using gas-powered vehicles, raising livestock, agriculture and deforestation, as well as waste and recycling pollution all contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. And the burning of coal, oil, and natural gas to produce electricity and heat accounts for one quarter of worldwide human-driven emissions. In the past, economic progress has come with an environmental cost, which means if the world continues with business as usual, emissions will keep rising. So what can we do? To actually see change, greenhouse gas emissions need to be reduced on a global scale. If things don't change, scientists predict that sea levels will rise another one to eight feet by the year 2100. And corn and wheat production could be affected as soon as 2030. No one person and no one country can solve this alone. But by prioritizing climate policies and by finding renewable energy alternatives and ways to remove greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere, we can make a difference in stopping climate change. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A man seen on camera emerging from the flames of a wildfire in Spain. He is now fighting for his life. Officials say that he was airlifted to the hospital with severe burns and is now in serious condition. He'd been trying to dig a ditch, a trench, to slow down the flames as they encroached on his town when the wind changed direction and engulfed his excavator. That wildfire has since been brought under control, but others are raging as Spain deals with extreme and deadly heat. Cubans are also dealing with sweltering weather, causing daily blackouts, but the government says that there's no way to keep the lights on. Officials say a lack of funding has postponed much needed maintenance at power plants. It reflects a deepening economic crisis that's worsened with the pandemic and now Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Floodwaters came up to chest level for some residents in western India after incessant rain caused rivers there to overflow. 89 villages were flooded in the deadly storm. Drone video shows its impact on farms in the area, which severely damaged crops. This year's monsoon season has led to record-breaking rain in several regions. Imagine a time when beer was used to dress a wound or a gin and tonic was prescribed to help cure malaria. Alcohol of all types has been used dating back thousands of years medicinally. And now one of the foremost booze experts in the country, dubbed the Booze Writer's Booze Writer, is out with a new book detailing the fascinating history of alcohol. Camper English is here to discuss doctors and distillers, the remarkable medicinal history of beer, wine, spirits, and cocktails. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. So you're an expert in the field of alcohol and alcademics. Uh, you've even found a website about uh, safer cocktail techniques that have been widely implemented in bars around the world. How did you find yourself exploring the medicinal history of alcohol? Well, really, one day I was writing about the gin and tonic, and I wanted to find a more accurate creation date for the drink. And that led me to books on uh, the history of medicine, because the history of cocktails is not so well documented. So I started searching in the books on malaria, because as we know, um, quinine in tonic water was used to prevent and cure malaria. So many books later and many months later, I learned so much about the history of medicine that I thought I would put it together in, in a, a narrative, combining that with history of alcohol, which is my specialty. The history of alcohol is your specialty. And you were saying many books later, many months later. I was wondering, many cocktails later as well? <laughs> well, you know, I had to do the thorough research. Exactly. So, so what is that research process like during the writing of a book like this? It, and an expert, as an expert in the field, what was the most interesting thing that you learned? 
Oh gosh, so much. Um, I learned a lot about the roots used in root beer, and I learned about how whiskey was used for just about everything in the old American West when it was cowboy medicine, essentially. And a lot about um, the history of medicine that I didn't know before, like how the balancing of the four humors in Greek and Roman times would, uh, doctors would prescribe different wine depending on if you were more phlegmatic or melancholic and things like that. Um, it was just full of information that, that I hadn't uh, really realized touched alcohol along every step of the way. And, and so those are some of the interesting things. Was there anything really strange, unusual that you came across? Oh, sure, plenty of that too. There's, you know, lots of purging and bleeding with, with old bad medicine, essentially, until we got up to modern day antibiotics. Medicine looked kind of messy a lot of the time. And um, yeah, there are a lot of strange cures with uh, sweating out um, mercury and uh, uh, bleeding and purging and uh, prescribing root beer for all sorts of things that it did not cure. So in that case, you're talking about things that didn't actually work. But of course, in the book, we learn many of the libations that we enjoy today were originally created in some form of medicinal purposes. Are there any historic health claims in the book that remain medically sound today? Well, I tend to say if, if you need to get healthy, see your doctor. And if you need a great cocktail, see your bartender. But there are uh, some things that are true. Alcohol itself is a great uh, antiseptic. It's used in like hand sanitizer in hospitals. And some of the herbs that are used in bitter aperitifs and digestive liqueurs have been proven to stimulate stomach juices and things like that. But uh, in general, um, a lot of things might be historically useful, but not um, useful anymore today. You know, I remember my grandmother would say, like, if you had a stomach ache or something, drink some some ginger ale, right? You know, a lot of people kind of go along with that thinking. But when you're feeling a little under the weather, what is your go-to drink? <laughs> oh, well, I suppose ginger, ginger ale for the, the upset stomach as well. Um, and uh, my mother always gave us Gatorade, so I still do that, rather than reaching for a whiskey. Although I have to say on a cold winter's night, a hot toddy is lovely. <laughs> How about during the summer? Because right now we're dealing with this really outrageous heat. What's your go-to cocktail at that point? I absolutely go for a gin and tonic. It's one of my favorite drinks of all times. And uh, everything in it was at one point used medicinally from the juniper and the gin uh, was used as a uh, diuretic. The uh, tonic waters was used against malaria, the scurvy um, preventing, preventing lime uh, that's in there, as well as the soda water itself was considered of great medicinal value a long time ago. Well, I'll drink to that. Next time I place my order, I'll say, Doc, this is for medicinal purposes. I'll take another gin and tonic. Make it a double. Camper English, we thank you so much. His new book, Doctors and Distillers, The Remarkable Medicinal History of Beer, Wine, Spirits, and Cocktails, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, something that many people would hate at their wedding, people who are not invited. Why one couple gave a warm welcome to a bus full of wedding crashers. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. So you remember, likely, your wedding day, it's always a day to remember, never forget. But for a pair of Green Bay Packers fans tying the knot, that notion was solidified when a bus full of NFL players crashed their reception. Reporter Andrea Lyon from our partner station, KTSP, takes us inside these touchdown nuptials in our local lowdown. A bus came up. And we're all looking like, what is this big green bus doing I was just in like the parking turning lot? Around or something. That's what we thought. I was like, they're turning around, they're doing something weird. And all of a sudden, these big football players got out. And they're like, are you guys Packer fans? We're like, of course, we're from Wisconsin, right? A perfect wedding is one thing, but a Packers wedding, well, that's a Wisconsin dream. It wasn't even on the new Mr. and Mrs. wish list. Nonetheless, Green Bay's road trip took the athletes to lacrosse dropping in on Kevin and Megan's wedding for more than 40 minutes, hitting the photo booth with their guests. Are we doing this? No. Even challenging some of their friends to a little, well, not so little, arm wrestling match. It was so funny. One of them was arm wrestling, and the guy was just sitting there. He wasn't doing anything. You can't even budge up. Yeah. And the wedding party quickly learned not only are these guys great on the turf, but some of them showed off their dance skills too. And there was a guy, Amazing. Tony Mall. He is absolutely hilarious. He was just ripping up the dance floor. Like <laughs> his personality was just, he was, he was amazing. So he definitely stood out. And before they boarded their green and gold bus, the players wanted to make sure the couple remembered their visit forever, signing Go Pack Go on the couple's guest list, shaped like a globe. We cannot wait for a photographer to send us the photos from it and just reminisce over it. Very exciting for them. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news. 